Hey class, uh, I hope uh, you're not having too much trouble finishing up the homework and the exam. Uh, if you are, uh, please feel free to reach out with out to me with any questions that you have. Uh, okay, so I don't want to cover too much ground. I know you're probably uh, playing catch up in each of your classes now since um, you know we were snowed in for the last uh, week and a half. Um, so uh, I thought we could burn some time with uh, some material that won't be on the exam. Uh, and I want to discuss something that you're probably going to encounter, or you will certainly encounter, uh, whenever you take um, uh, electromagnetism and waves, the, the second half of physics. Uh, so speaking for myself, I, um, I was much better at Newtonian <laughs> mechanics and, and uh, physics. Uh, than I was whenever we got to electromagnetism and waves. Uh, for whatever reason, it was just more intuitive to me. Um, but that doesn't mean that I wasn't interested in uh, light and uh, electromagnetic magnetic wave behavior and so forth. Uh, so I want to focus on one concept uh, and, uh, you know, we'll pick and choose and, and we'll try and cover uh, a broad spectrum of just various topics and uh, I try to make them uh, unique with each semester so that uh, I, I don't repeat myself too much so, and so that uh, I, I make sure that I'm constantly putting in the effort to understand uh, how it uh, you receiving it the first time uh, might need for me to continue to, to pay a certain attention. Uh, <laughs> assuming that was a sentence, right? Uh, okay, so, uh, so the concept that I wanted to discuss today uh, is uh, total internal reflection. Uh, okay, so if you've ever uh, dropped a coin or something in a pool uh, or, you know, in a, a clear uh, creek or a river or whatever, uh, and you've reached for it, or if you've ever seen a fish and you tried to catch it, uh, you'll notice that when you reach for that, that object, whatever it is that's underneath the water, that it's not uh, where it looks like it should be. And even if you just stick your hand under the water, and you look, it looks like there's a, a bend that's created there uh, from the water. Now you can tell that your bones didn't break as soon as you stuck them in the water, so it can't be that there's all of a sudden this, uh, this you know, uh, bending that's happening there, not physically. So it's just a perceived bending. So, uh, you know, uh, along the way in, in the history of science, uh, there were various attempts to explain this, and. Uh, the law that we ended up coming up with was named after uh, Snell. Right? I, I can't remember his first name at, at the moment, but it's called Snell's Law, uh, and it's this one. Uh, and so it's uh, it involves sine theta, right? and we'll explain where that comes in in a moment. Um, but it's the index of refraction from the first medium. So in, in the case of water, uh, it's air, so your perception from the air. Uh, and then times the angle of incidence with the, the normal. So if you were to draw or if you were to stick a, a stake you know, straight through, uh, then that would be the normal. It's sticking up at a, a 90 degree angle. Right? So here it's this dotted line. Right? So then the angle of incidence is this one. Right? So it's not off of the horizon uh, like we tend to do whenever we're discussing the unit circle and so forth. It's, it's this angle here uh, with the normal. Uh, so the index of refraction times sine of theta 1, where theta 1, uh, well, actually the way I've done it, theta 1 is down here, right, uh, is equal to the index of refraction for the second medium times the uh, sine of the, the angle of incidence for that second medium, right? So these would be the angles, right? So this one here, you know, with the green line, and this one here, and you can see how the light bends, whatever. So as you're looking down from from your perspective, so you're standing right here and you're looking in and you're trying to catch a fish that's presumably over here, right? uh, and you miss, uh, and, uh, and it's because uh, you were seeing, whatever you were seeing, the, the light bent down here, right? So uh, the thing that you were looking at was right here, uh, but you tried to reach and grab it over here, and so you missed. Uh, and the phenomenon that, that explains that is, uh, you know, Snell's law, 
Uh, and it just says that the light is going to change and it's going to change speeds essentially whenever uh, well, <laughs> uh, well yeah I mean it, it, in, in essence changes speeds whenever it hits the different medium so you know we think of speed of light as a constant ha <laughs> you know you, you crazy fools light never changes well the speed of light in a vacuum is a constant that's that's what we think of it as and I will encourage you to get in the habit now of uh, calling it the the speed of causality uh, through a vacuum uh, for uh, just reasons that will uh, hopefully come to light eventually right um, so okay so we know that there is this bending effect and that the angle that if you were to look up from the water and look out uh, that the same phenomena is going to happen it's just in the opposite direction so if you were to look out this direction then you would be seeing whatever's over here and so a question is, okay, well, you know, if that's happening, is it possible to reach a point where you try to look out and, and you simply can't see out at that angle? You can't see beyond that angle? And the answer is yes, right? So if you look on a, at a, a clear lake, right, uh, and you see a mountain in the distance, you'll see that it's reflected. There's a, a reflection of that mountain and it's the inverted image of it, right? Uh, and it's coming off of the, you know, this crystal lake <laughs> appearance, right? Uh, and so that is uh, essentially exactly what we're discussing. So if you look at it at the right angle, instead of seeing through it or seeing some bending of the light, you see a reflection, right? And so uh, coming up from the water, you'll see something similar. There's this region where uh, any light that's approaching uh, the, the barrier, the point where the water meets the air or you know whatever other uh, medium you're looking at right uh, where if it's bouncing or if it's approaching from this region anywhere in this region then it's going to completely bounce off the edge and it's going to stay internal uh, and so uh, this property of uh, total internal reflection uh, is actually something that's leveraged in uh, fiber optics so you have this glass cable and uh, you know, presumably if, if the next medium is, is air or something else, um, then uh, the, the light, if, if it hits it at, so at the right angle, so in, in a region that is the right angle, uh, then uh, not a, 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 a orthogonality right angle, right? just the appropriate angle, um, then uh, it'll stay internal to the cable. It'll just bounce off of it and reflect and it'll continue on its way. Uh, but it won't necessarily have the correct line of approach. It'll just skim off the surface and, and bounce back in. Um, and so uh, this concept, you know, it's, it's interesting in its own right, uh, but uh, now I, I want to propose to you uh, a way to view uh, the internal energy of an atom, the, the, the nucleus of an atom. Uh, okay, so uh, let's... Um, Let's look at a diagram first. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay, so we'll carry on this once we've burned enough time in the class. So this was the Rutherford model of the atom. Right? So uh, one of the early guesses, once uh, everyone agreed that there was some smallest unit of matter or units of matter uh, that everything else was composed of, uh, and then they began to see that there was this positively charged region in the center and a negatively charged region on the outside. The, one of the first guesses was uh, by Ernest Rutherford, I believe. Uh, and it was something very much like a solar system where you have this uh, massive center uh, and then uh, you have these uh, solid objects that are in orbit around it. Uh, and then over time that got modified to say, well, okay, it's more of a probability cloud and so forth. Uh, and and I, I will uh, hope to convince you that it is uh, e something uh, more continuous than a, a probability cloud or a region of probability, uh, that there is this uh, continuum and it's the, the folds and the wrinkles and the, and the waves across this continuum uh, that actually give the, uh, the appearance of, of what we perceive. Uh, okay, so in this model, this would be like a sun, and these would be like the planets. Uh, but it was determined that that's simply not a very good model for for what's actually happening. Uh, in part, it because it didn't agree with experimentation. 
Um, and so uh, there is now we have this idea that you know electrons um, they occupy sort of a region and that region is defined with probability uh, but I, I would argue uh, and, and I have argued <laughs> in a previous semester uh, that uh, rather than um, a probability that it is this uh, region and, and it's uh, a spatial displacement through uh, <laughs> through a, a fourth dimension uh, through a fourth spatial dimension so that uh, we have this hypersphere that encompasses what we per perceive to be the universe uh, and then positive and negative charges are uh, are sort of these regions of displacement either uh, in or out of this this hypersphere so either it's it's uh, elevated or declined or uh, aspired or inspired or whatever uh, in in these uh, regions uh, and then uh, you know if, if it's more or less offsetting then you would get something that's like a neutron uh, but then these regions of probability they are just these regions of depression where uh, you can sort of focus that depression into a single point uh, under a magnetic field, and uh, you know, <laughs> if if it's appropriate, then uh, then you would get the um, the mass part of it, right? So everything uh, you will study, you know, wave particle duality and and so forth. Uh, but okay, let's skip ahead, right? That's that's uh, a little more granular than I was hoping to uh, deal with. So what uh, I would like you to consider is, well, what's going on in the center here? So uh, if this model isn't correct and uh, we can't really see inside of the nucleus of an atom to see what's going on and, and that's kind of why uh, particle accelerators were constructed or are constructed is to try and smash the hydrogen atoms together or you know other particles and uh, and then see what comes out to see if we can uh, discern any new information so then what's actually happening inside of here uh, so if we use this alternative model that I'm proposing then um, then it is uh, something a little more uh, like what you would expect to see in a spiral galaxy. So rather than uh, this <laughs> representing a, a single atom, right, the galaxy isn't, uh, you know, the electrons orbiting around some galactic center or whatever. No, I'm saying that the nucleus would look something like this, uh, where, uh, you know, obviously you would have to uh, assign colors to these displacements and so forth. Um, but you can see uh, how uh, you know, it, it would have uh, an axis about which the uh, the angular momentum uh, acts, where where it's essentially spinning around uh, some axis, which you know maybe rotating in space and so forth. Uh, but it it does have um, this fixed point or, or this fixed region or a, a dipole where <laughs> you could essentially you could effectively you know, stick a rod through it or an imaginary line through the center uh, and those are, are the fixed points and, and the uh, all of the angular action, all of the rotation happens about that uh, and um, you know, it, it's not uh, <laughs> I, I haven't seen a, a reason why uh, everything has to move in a single direction as it would here but uh, the question that, that I want to ask or, or that I want to uh, uh, discuss is uh, why um, in this in the atom uh, why does the if everything is just a wave and it's not some some fixed thing in space at, at the smallest scale if it's not uh, something that is you know broken off from everything else if there's this continuum why doesn't it just cool off why doesn't it just flatten out if most of space is space and, and there's essentially room for it to to expand and flatten out uh, so that it's much smaller waves and, and it doesn't have this persistence of, of an atom. Uh, and so uh, I want you to keep this in mind where you can see that there's, um, it, it's a spiral galaxy which that we're looking at and, and that I'm going to ask you to consider. Uh, but you can imagine that as you get away from the center, you could draw these sort of contours of potential where uh, these regions in, in space have um, similar gravitational potential. They're uh, effectively um, the same distance uh, away from from the center. Uh, so, okay, so keep that in mind as, <laughs> as we come back to, to this other topic. Uh, okay, so the, the answer, and, and this 
uh, phenomena that I've introduced that I want you to consider uh, is this concept of total internal reflection. So uh, if everything is just a wave, if it all just breaks down into these waves, you know, how is it that uh, that these atoms don't want to just flatten out into flat space or, you know, mostly flat space? It seems like uh, for whatever region that, or for whatever reason, the energy concentrates and it appears to concentrate, but every time we measure it, it wants to radiate out energy. Everything wants to cool off and, and tend to some uh, homogeneity. Uh, and, and in fact, if you study um, the differential equations, you'll come across the heat equation, uh, and you'll see that uh, this simple principle of saying that if you take two points, uh, so the simplest case is to consider a, a metal rod, uh, and it's uh, initially heated unevenly, or if you have two rods, one is hot and one is cold, and you connect them uh, on the edges, you touch them together on the edges, how does the heat flow from the hot rod into the cool rod, uh, and you know what does that look like as it evolves over time? So we would expect that eventually they will tend to a common temperature, and that temperature would be the average of whatever you began with, uh, less whatever radiates off into uh, the vacuum or, or the air or whatever uh, the surrounding medium is. Uh, but uh, they will eventually tend toward uh, a common temperature. So uh, what is the function that describes that? Uh, and so the, the rule that uh, I believe it was Foyer used to come up with a, a solution to that was to just say, okay, well, if you take any point on that rod, so it's effectively a line or a, a line segment, you take any point, then the next step forward in time, at the next instant, it will be the average of uh, whatever it was before, right? But uh, it, it will tend towards the average of its neighboring temperatures. So if you step once to the right and once to the left, and you take the average of those temperatures, then that's what that point will be at the next uh, moment in time. So that if you have cool over here and hot over here, then uh, e each point along the way at every instant in time uh, is taking the average of its neighbors and it's, so the temperature would be high over here, or uh, sorry, high over here. Uh, sorry, I, I keep getting it backwards with the camera, right? So <laughs> it'll, it'll be high. Uh, and then uh, it'll tend down as it comes across towards the cool end. Right? Uh, and so um, that models, whenever you solve the differential equation, you say, okay, well, you have time stepping forward on time on one side of the equation and stepping uh, left or right, or once you get into three dimensions, left, right, forward, back, or up and down, uh, it, uh, we need some way to relate those, how <laughs> how you can go from a you can have some point of origin and then you can say well what is everything else as you move forward in time or you move spatially what is that relationship uh, and so it, you end up with something that has a, an exponent it's a product of uh, an exponent and um, which is defined as a function with time with respect to time and then uh, sines and cosines which uh, are defined as functions in space uh, and then uh, some linear combination of those would, would solve the system. Right? Uh, so you end up with sine and cosine and, and an exponential uh, from this simple rule that you take the average of two neighboring points. And, and that's what I want to come back to. So the system was originally described as just averaging two points that are, you know, you have some midpoint and then you have two surrounding points and then you just take the average and, and that's what the midpoint will tend to. If you do that enough and over a long enough time, then it'll eventually cool off so that you have this uniform temperature with very minor deviations as you go forward in time. But essentially, those deviations disappear um, measurably after uh, not a long time. So uh, is this a good model for describing what's going on inside of the atom? And uh, if not, why not? Uh, so uh, not directly right <laughs> not without modification uh, so if it was then uh, then we would expect to see uh, everything just sort of flatten out um, you know relatively quickly everything would uh, all of the energy would disperse somewhat uniformly throughout space but we don't see that right like we 
we have our lives where we are composed of atoms for you know uh, 60 70 80 100 years sometimes right uh, and that's just us and our our solar system has been around for a billion years or for a few billion years and our galaxy for a few billion more years right so if we can persist all this time and presumably the atoms aren't you know just spontaneously disappearing why aren't they there's the space to to take that energy to to sort of spread out that energy evenly so why does it not uh, and I, I propose that uh, well, because there is this, this wave action happening, uh, that we see something uh, internal to the uh, inside of the atom, uh, uh, internal to the nucleus of the atom, uh, something like total internal reflection, uh, which means that uh, on, on a subatomic scale, uh, that there is not a single index of refraction, uh, like you would see here, right? Because then you wouldn't expect, uh, if it was just a, a common index of uh, refraction, then there would be no barrier here, right? So returning to this, right, where we have our contours, right, of potential uh, and higher concentrations of energy towards the center and lower concentrations as we get further out, right, uh, then we could consider something like a, a topographic uh, map where uh, you have these contours that sort of uh, measure different uh, different displacements from uh, from sea level uh, right so whatever that flattened space is uh, you can represent them using uh, something like this uh, and then uh, the the greatest point of displacement would be uh, at whatever the most interior ring is and then uh, <laughs> it, it is a spatial displacement right so these rings, these contours, can be drawn at constant levels of spatial displacement uh, vertically, or you know, in in that w coordinate, um, and uh, and you can imagine how you know the light is sort of swirling around it, sort of uh, like it's happening within the galaxy. Right? So uh, the contours <laughs> are. Uh, their constant levels of potential, uh, we wouldn't expect them to be so clean as this. We would expect it to be a little fuzzier. Uh, and they are themselves defined by this uh, higher frequency wave. Uh, so uh, if we look at uh, the energy that we think about that does escape, right? And uh, then uh, let's go to one or a couple more uh, representations, right? So then um, the energy that does escape in, in the emission spectrum. So this is from the electron, right? the amount of energy that is uh, released whenever it drops down to this level uh, for an electron and the hydrogen atom, uh, or the amount of energy that it takes to be promoted to the next level, right? the next level in. Uh, and so these are in the nanometer, the hundreds of nanometer uh, range. So 10 to the minus nine times 121 to get it out of that lowest ring, uh, and so forth, right? Uh, and then uh, this is the, the second series and so forth. But um, the gamma radiation that defines the atomic nucleus uh, is in the range of 10 to the minus 12. So that was uh, 100 times 10 to the minus 9. So it's like on the order of 10 to the minus 7, 10 to the minus 7, 10 to the minus 8, uh, as you get along. Uh, but the gamma radiation uh, is 10 to the minus 12, so it's uh, at least a thousand times uh, more present <laughs> than than the energy that escapes. Right? Uh, so these contours, you know, uh, if, if you think about um, video, right, uh, or uh, uh, frame rates on a, a computer monitor, uh, these are uh, like 30 cycles per second or 60 cycles per second uh, or if you're a gamer and you want more it's like 90 or maybe 100 or whatever uh, and it gives us this perception uh, of uh, continuity uh, of some continuous presence and, and continuous evolution uh, and so that's a factor of up to 100 less than 100 so somewhere between 10 and 100 uh, this is Kind of what we consider uh, uh, from our perspective as as uh, you know, these evolved beings, 
uh, as uh, this continuous presence or this continuous evolution. Uh, so for something on the order of a, a thousand, right, a, a thousand times more present or uh, up to a hundred thousand times more present, uh, then these contours to the light that escapes, the light that is both absorbed and, and escapes from a hydrogen atom, uh, these are, you know, <laughs> in some sense they're ever present even though they themselves are, are just higher frequency waves. Uh, but uh, to the, the uh, longer wavelength and, and uh, shorter frequency, uh, uh, other internal energy uh, within the atom, uh, they're real, right? Uh, and so uh, they're real enough uh, to create a barrier, these uh, energy, these differences in, in potential energy. Um, so the reason that it that that I propose that the energy doesn't uh, just cool off from from these uh, atoms uh, is that uh, they it's active enough and and because of total internal reflection uh, it's able to retain this additional energy that that keeps it warm essentially so that it doesn't have to radiate off the the higher energy uh, and so um, and so it just keeps it 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 traps it in these rings. And then uh, eventually, um, you know, it's able to uh, to hit, uh, you know, at, at just the right angle. Maybe whenever uh, the, you know, it's uh, if you think of of it, uh, you know, orbiting in uh, some uh, you know root of unity or whatever. Then eventually, it finds that that uh, you know uh, that solution angle right it, it hits it at the right moment it's still you know been circling at the same uh, intervals but eventually it catches it in just the right way and then it's able to escape to the next energy level and so on and so forth uh, and so uh, the the timing of this or you know maybe it's it's trapped in there and it's waiting for tidal forces right like these uh, these galactic tidal forces to sort of modify the wavelength until uh, it's able to to catch uh, you know that contour in just the right way that it's able to uh, finally escape to the next level and so on and so forth. Right? Uh, okay, so uh, so then using this model to represent what's going on within the nucleus, uh, then uh, we can uh, we can consider something similar to what we had whenever we were discussing uh, the transition of light or waves from one medium to the next. Whenever we were discussing it at the the macroscopic level with light dealing, transmitting uh, between air and water, right? So now it's going between the innermost ring, right, from here to here, uh, and then from here to here, and we can see kind of how it bends, right? Uh, and so, you know, it would have its angle of incidence whenever, you know, it escapes, uh, and then, um, you know, uh, we could... <laughs> Theoretically, right through through massive computational effort, perhaps uh, w we can derive the these tiny variations in uh, the index of uh, refraction. Um, but uh, the the thing I want to point out here is that in these diagrams, the hypotenuse R uh, is going to be um, something like whenever you deal with the the calculus of it, you you would like to deal with either some uh, infinitesimally small step in space or infinitesimally small step in time, so either dx or dt. Uh, but uh, sometimes whenever you're dealing with polar coordinates, you deal with dr, right, where it's this variation in radius. Uh, well, dr is not going to be constant, uh, and um, it's its own trick in that sense, right? Um, so what I would note that, that if you were to make the computational effort here, uh, is that r is going to be a constant length, right? And that uh, we could call it dr if you want, right? Uh, and so that change in uh, radius or, or radial distance uh, is going to be proportional to that infinitesimal step in time. Uh, times the the speed of light, which is the uh, the rate of propagation <laughs> in a vacuum, right? So the the speed of light, uh, which is the constant. Uh, but you don't want to deal with dt directly, um, 
because you're dealing, you're attempting to deal with relativity uh, at the <laughs> subatomic scale, and so uh, time is relative, and so uh, the the step in space that you would get uh, is going to be uh, proportional to uh, the uh, <laughs> the angle of incidence, essentially, uh, as it's it's coming out of there. So the inclination for that particular contour. Uh, and this is what you would expect from, from Lorentz contraction. So uh, if you ever come across that, right? Uh, so the the <laughs> logic behind time dilation and uh, so forth. But um, OK, so I, <laughs> I wanted to introduce this concept uh, and try and motivate uh, your uh, your interest in, in waves whenever you start studying them, if you're not already studying them, or if you haven't already been through that, right? and Snell's Law in particular. Uh, and uh, so that uh, you can keep in mind that there may be these applications for, for that particular rule uh, further down the line. So, uh, <laughs> okay, I, we've heard half an hour. I think it's time that we could, uh, we could get into the lecture proper now. Uh, and so let's, uh, let's pick up with where we left off. So the last thing we discussed was this merge sort, right? And so we were using... Uh, our definition of divide and conquer recurrence relation uh, to describe essentially the, the number of operations that some function f, uh, some uh, computer or program defined function, some subroutine f, uh, acting on some array of size n. Right? Uh, and it's described in terms of the recurrence right, where we divide up the uh, the size of the array or collection that we pass into our recursively invoked f. Uh, and then a is the number of times that we uh, invoke this method. So whenever we're merging, we divide everything up into two. And then whenever that returns, uh, we've actually invoked it twice, once for the left and once for the right. But whenever we were dealing with um, a binary search, we divide everything up into two but we only look either left or right and we throw away the other side. We don't really care about it. We're just digging down until we find the, the index of the item that we're searching for. Uh, and then uh, g of n here is uh, just the additional operation. So in the case of merge sort, uh, this is the loop that you're executing in order to gather up the, the two arrays into a single array. Uh, okay, so now we see that here, right? So the function m is invoked twice, uh, and whenever it's invoked, it's passed uh, a collection that's half the size of whatever was passed into it originally. Uh, and then on each pass, uh, we invoke the merge operation. So this is merge sort, and then this is merge. And the merge operation is just full of loops, essentially that. Uh, execute a total of n times or something in proportion to it uh, to join two sorted arrays into a single sorted array. Uh, okay, so now we have a theorem, right, or we would like to discuss a theorem. Uh, let f be an increasing function that satisfies the recurrence relation f of n is equal to a times f uh, passed in n divided by b uh, plus c, right? So it's exactly of the form where we saw before, um, where this is the number of times that our function is invoked. This is the size of the collection that our function is invoked with whenever we call it recursively. So b and everything we've looked at so far would be 2, and then a is either 1 or 2 for what we've looked at, but it can be other values, right? Uh, and then c is just all of the extra work that you do uh, outside of the recursive call. Right? So whenever n is divisible by b, where a is greater than or equal to 1, b is an integer greater than 1. Uh, uh, if b is an integer greater than 1 and c is a positive real number, then this. right? So uh, everything is <laughs> non-zero and a and b are both greater than or equal to 1 or b is greater than 1. Uh, so I want you to note that if b is equal to 1, then we're invoking this function and passing it in a collection of the same size over and over again. So that's not 
strictly divide and conquer. We haven't divided it by anything, right? Uh, it's more conquering us if we're doing that. Uh, essentially, we'll get a stack overflow. So if you've done it properly and, and you're actually breaking up the problem, uh, then you can hope for a solution. And that solution, uh, if A is greater than 1, uh, will uh, have, have a, a number of operations on the order of N to the log of A base B. Uh, and uh, if A is equal to 1, as was the case in binary search, uh, then you'll have something that's on the order of log N. Right? Uh, okay, so... Uh, actually, I... Is that correct? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Uh, okay, so then... Uh, when a is greater than 1 and n is equal to b to the k, where k is a positive integer, then our function uh, with the form f of n equals uh, some constant times n to the log b, log base b of a, plus some other constant, where our constant uh, is some initial value, where the first constant is some initial value plus c divided by a minus 1 uh, and uh, the second constant is negative c divided by a minus 1 uh, okay so uh, that is used to demonstrate the master theorem uh, which we'll state without proof uh, let f be an increasing function that satisfies the recurrence relation uh, we divide it by b we execute the recursive function a times uh, and then we perform an additional number of operations that is a potentially a constant or a constant times uh, d number of loops acting on n elements right so uh, it's some constant times n squared if there's a loop within a loop uh, some constant times n if there's just a single loop or the uh, series of loops, as was the case with merge, right? We had this be in. Uh, if it's a loop within a loop within a loop, then d equals three, right? So, uh, so it's d is essentially the number of nested loops, or, or the extent to which you have nested your loops, uh, and then in, uh, well, it's just the size of the collection. So, if you have a loop, then this is, comes into play, and if you don't have a loop, then it's just a constant number of operations. Uh, okay, so you have a recurrence relation that meets this criteria. You divide it up uh, into B partitions, and then you evaluate some A number of those uh, divisions uh, recursively. Uh, whenever N is equal to B to the K, where K is some positive integer, uh, then uh, and, and the reason we say that is that you're dividing it up into an even number of elements, right? So uh, if n is a, a power of 2, <laughs> then uh, then everything works out perfectly, right? We don't have any round off or whatever. We can say that it's exact or, you know, the division was, was exact, right? So whenever you're considering this, just think b is 2 and then n is some power of 2, right? Uh, and then if a is greater than or equal to 1, uh, B, if B is some integer greater than one, and if C and D are real numbers with uh, where C is positive and D is either zero or one, right? So, uh, <laughs> so that you're not doing something strange where you have some negative number of operations each time you invoke the function, which isn't possible, right? So let's say you haven't <laughs> messed up your representation, right? That's all that this is saying. Uh, is essentially that it's something that you would encounter right, in a, a program, in a subroutine. Then, if that's the case, uh, then if A is less than B to the D, uh, then your function uh, has a number of operations proportional to N to the D. Right? Uh, if uh, A is equal to B to the D, then your number of operations is proportional to n to the d times log n. Uh, so uh, this was the case uh, whenever we 
uh, uh, dealt with uh, merge sort, right? So it's in login to uh, sort uh, collection of n elements. Uh, so D was one in that case. Uh, or uh, if A is greater than B to the D, uh, then uh, it grows on the order of n to the log of A with base B. Uh, okay. Uh, so it says this, and I'm not convinced that I copied it down correctly because uh, the case where uh, uh, where we executed. Um, Actually, okay, that might be correct. As I say, the case where we executed binary search, uh, D, there was no loop, right, whenever we were searching for it with binary search. Uh, but A was one and B was two, but since there was no loop, then D was zero. So that uh, we had the case where it was one is equal to one, right? Uh, but because D was zero, it was just in to the zero times log n. So that was correct. Um, so I'm <laughs> struggling to think of an example where a is less than b to the d uh, so that you end up with something of this form. Um, uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> if, if I could come up with something that, then I will. But uh, it, it's uh, worth your time to think about it for a little while and see if you can come up with an example. And, and even if you think about it for you know 20 or 30 minutes and so you don't come up with an example. The fact that you've thought about this for 20 or 30 minutes will really help your understanding with it. Um, okay, so uh, for example, uh, merge sort uses no more than m of n operations to sort a list of n elements uh, where a was 2, b was 2, and then we had some loop to join all the elements into a single collection. Uh, okay. Uh, so in this case, A is equal to B to the D, and we can conclude from the master theorem that merge sort has a runtime complexity on the order of N log N. Right. Okay, uh, so now the principle of inclusion and exclusion. Uh, and so uh, this is, um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's a really long-winded version of what we dealt with whenever we were uh, dealing with the overlap of two sets. Uh, so previously we had an example um, where we were looking for a representative from the math department and it could be either a student member or either a student or a member of the faculty uh, and then in some cases we said okay well if there are some students that are also members of the faculty then we would have double counted uh, and so the size of our union would be smaller than the size of the individual sets added together, right? And that error would be exactly uh, the overlap, the number of students that were also faculty members. And so when there is no overlap, then the error is zero. Um, but uh, if we start joining together multiple sets and we do it in a single operation, then uh, the subtraction rule that we used uh, for that other example uh, has to be modified to account for this new form, right? And so the principle of inclusion and exclusion is that modification. And the, the notation is gnarly, I'll admit. If, if you're not used to the cup symbol and you're not used to the caps or whatever, so these are union operations, the U's are this, and the, the horseshoes or the caps or whatever uh, are intersections. And so uh, it means if the element is in this set and in this other set, right? And then you perform that for every combination of pairs of sets. Uh, and then so on and so forth. So what it says is that the size of a union of sets, right? And so a union of sets is going to produce another set. But the thing about sets, right? Sets are not just collections. They're not just arrays. They have the added property that their elements are distinct. Uh, and so uh, if you have a set that consists of the numbers one and two, and you have another set that consists of the numbers two and three, and you perform a union operation, you don't get 
one, two, two, three, you get one, two, three, right? So you get the distinct elements from the individual sets, right? Uh, and so the size of those sets <laughs> requires a, a correction. And you're correcting based on uh, the intersections. So how many times was something counted twice? Right? And so the first thing you do is you look at the pairs of intersections. Right? Uh, and so um, you know if you're only dealing with two sets, then you're only dealing with a single intersection, right? But the more sets you deal with, the more corrections you have. So you've overcounted uh, by the number, uh, <laughs> the size of, of these uh, intersections, right? But uh, it's possible that you subtracted too many whenever you were dealing with these corrections, and the size of uh, and the number of elements that you uh, overcorrected whenever you subtracted by uh, was equal to the intersections of the triples. But then you might have overcompensated whenever you restored those numbers. Uh, and so then you would have to remove the uh, intersections, the size of the intersections of the quadruples, and so on and so forth. And so you end up performing these series of actions, subtracting off the ones that were counted uh, too many times, and then adding back the ones that were overcorrected, and then subtracting off the ones that were overcompensated, and then subtracting off the ones that were overcorrected, and so forth. A until eventually the last time that you have to perform this correction uh, is uh, whenever you measure the size of the intersection of all of the sets uh, and so uh, if uh, n is even uh, as was the case whenever we were dealing with two sets right uh, then uh, you're subtracting and if n is odd then you're adding you know, as was the case when we were dealing with three sets, right? Uh, and so that's what the theorem is, and it says that essentially you have to continue to measure these corrections. Uh, you have to continue to correct and correct and correct, uh, and then once you finally take it into account all of the different ways that you could have messed it up before, uh, then you will have found the exact size of the set, right? Uh, and so uh, you'll see a lot of definitions and theorems where you say if you're dealing with disjoint sets <laughs> so that there is no overlap uh, then uh, well if you're dealing with disjoint sets then this part is true right you don't have to deal with all of this correction junk it's just all contained right here but if you're not dealing with disjoint sets then it gets messy right so that's the value of, of, uh, uh, of dealing with sets where there is no intersection you don't have to correct more but here's the theorem in case you do have to deal with it. Uh, okay, so now an example. Right? So application of inclusion and exclusion. So consider a set with n elements. Now consider a set, uh, a series of properties, property one, property two, property three, and so forth. Uh, so, uh, right, for example, uh, the first property might be that a given number is divisible by two. The second uh, property is that a uh, number is divisible by three, and the third property is that a number is divisible by five. Uh, and so you can carry on until you've got the first n primes, right? So something is divisible by each of these primes. Uh, let a sub i be some subset of a, right? Uh, and so, uh, you know, don't get too lost in the notation, right? So let's say these are all of the numbers that are divisible by five, right? Uh, and that's going to be some subset of all of the numbers. Right? Uh, so uh, they have this property and so as we're discussing it the property is that it's divisible by whatever this ith prime is. Uh, so uh, right yeah. Uh, so then the set a sub i would be the, in the collection of elements of a that are divisible by that ith prime number. Uh, the number of elements with these properties uh, is denoted by n, so we're counting the number of elements uh, that satisfy these properties. Right? Uh, okay, so we can also note it that way. So now we have this uh, complement uh, to the property, right? So pi prime, uh, so it's not divisible by the ith prime, it's going to be those uh, numbers that are not divisible by that ith prime. So 
the numbers that are not divisible by 5, which is everything that is, uh, except for the ones that are divisible by 5, right? Uh, okay, um, so then uh, we can also count the number of elements that satisfy each of these properties, the numbers uh, that do not satisfy any of these, right? Uh, and so if it's not divisible by any of the other primes, uh, then it's going to be a prime number itself, right? That's what we would expect. So the, the prime numbers are the ones that are not divisible by other primes. Okay, uh, okay. so then recall uh, that n is just the size of our set A, right? Uh, this n, right? Not the one that uh, is describing all of the properties that it satisfies. Right? So then the total number of uh, elements that we're considering is the combination of the numbers that are not div that don't satisfy these properties that are not divisible by these first n primes, uh, and then uh, the size of the union of sets uh, of the composites, right? So, and then all of the elements that do satisfy these. So, anything that's divisible by six is both divisible by two and by three. So there's overlap, right? Um, six for example, <laughs> is in both of these sets. It's both divisible by two and three, right? Uh, but the union operation returns distinct elements, right? So then it's all of the primes and then all of the composites. That's what we're saying here. Uh, okay, and so uh, just manipulating this equation, if we move this to the left-hand side, then we have that the primes are equal to all of the elements minus the composites. Uh, okay, so now recall from the principle of inclusion and exclusion that uh, the size of our union of these composite numbers, uh, or this, <laughs> this is the general term, right? The size of the union of a set A1 with set A2 with set A3 and so on up to AN is equal to the sum of the individual, the, of the size of the individual sets corrected by the intersection of every pair of sets, corrected by the intersection of every triple of sets, corrected, and so on and so forth, until you've taken every intersection, or the intersection of every set at once. Right? Uh, okay, so then uh, the, <laughs> the number of primes uh, in less than or equal to n, right? Uh, so all of the, the numbers that uh, do not satisfy property 1 and do not satisfy property 2 and so on and so forth. So the primes uh, are equal to the total number of elements in, right? Um, so if we're looking for the number of primes less than 100 or something like that, uh, then uh, we would have the original size of our set minus uh, this union, right? Well, this union, the size of this union, so minus the composites, essentially, but this is given by the principle of inclusion and exclusion. So then it's n, as before, minus this, which is actually this, right? And you'll notice that we flip the sign everywhere so that uh, this, because of this minus sign, is now negative, and then that minus sign flips the intersection of pairs to be positive and the intersection of triples to be negative and so on and so forth. Right? Uh, okay. Uh, okay, so that's an example of uh, just to keep straight what it is all of those corrections are doing. So if you consider the set of you know counting the number of primes less than a, a given element, uh, it's not as simple as uh, you know, taking the first thousand numbers and then subtracting the numbers that are divisible by two and then subtracting the numbers that are divisible by three. Uh, because you will have overcounted them because some elements, some numbers, some composites are divisible by more than one prime. In fact, you would in general expect that to be the case. Uh, so the proper way to count those or something analogous to that is to apply the principle of inclusion and exclusion. Uh, okay. So now uh, we have a we have that exact example, okay? But we're going to count uh, using real numbers or uh, uh, example numbers. Right? Uh, so consider the number of primes not exceeding one hundred. 
So I think we've done the sieve of Eratosthenes in this class. Uh, if not, <laughs> uh, then uh, we will do it before the end of the semester. Right? Uh, okay, so uh, just, uh, recall from the sieve of Eratosthenes uh, and principles of arithmetic that if a number is not divisible by a prime number less than or equal to its square root, then the number is itself prime. Um, and the reason for that, so we're looking for primes less than or equal to uh, 100. Uh, and so uh, all of the composites uh, between 10, so what this is saying is that all of the composites between 10 and 100 uh, are going to be divisible by the primes less than or equal to 10. Right? And the reason for that, uh, the reason that we don't have to check beyond 10 whenever we're creating our sieve uh, is that uh, right here, right? So k is our number 100, right? So uh, if a times b is greater than uh, the square root of k times b, right? Uh, then, or if a and b are both greater than that, then the uh, then the first replacement, right, a is greater than the square root of k, and b is greater than the square root of k, well then their product is going to be greater than k, right? So then at least one of them needs to be less than the square root of k. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, okay. So we restate that, that uh, if we have not found a factor less than the square root of k, then k is prime. Uh, okay. So then, uh, in this example, we've chosen k to be 100, uh, and so we're going to test the numbers 2 through 100 to see if it's divisible by one of the primes less than or equal uh, to the square root of k. And we know that set exactly. We can just count those. Uh, so 2, 3, 5, and 7 are the prime numbers uh, less than or equal to the square root of 100, or which uh, the square root of 100 is 10, so these are the primes less than 10. Uh, okay, so then property 1. Uh, represents divisibility by 2, property 2 represents divisibility by 3, property 3 represents divisibility by 5, and property 4 represents divisibility by 7. Okay, uh, okay. Uh, so uh, the number of primes not exceeding 100 is the four prime numbers identified above and the set of numbers that lack uh, properties p1, p2, p3, and p4, right? So we noted that as not P1, not P2, not P3, not P4, right? Uh, or uh, 4 plus this set, right? So we've already counted four primes, and then we want the other uh, elements that satisfy not divisibility by 2, not divisibility by 3, not divisibility by 5, and not divisibility by 7. Okay, so our set, A, is the numbers 2 to 100 uh, and we exclude 1 because uh, it causes problems right <laughs> uh, so everything would be divisible by 1 uh, and so essentially we can't define primes if we include that as a prime uh, okay so then uh, or we have to include exceptions except 1 and so forth but so let's just accept 1 from the beginning okay so then uh, the size of our set is 99 uh, and the number of yet to be counted primes is this. Right. Okay, so then our set, 99, right? So now we're making substitutions in for this, right? Or this. Uh, yeah. Okay, so then. The size n was 99, and n was defined as the size of our set A. Uh, and then it's minus uh, these individually. Right? And so this is the principle of inclusion and exclusion. Right? I've just already made that substitution. Uh, okay, so it's minus the size of the sets individually, and then correcting for the pairs, and then uh, compensating for the triples, and then all the way down until we've dealt with the intersection of everything, right? The things that are divisible by 2, 3, 5, and 7. Uh, okay, so uh, 
can, you can use a floor function uh, to evaluate the sizes of these sets uh, without explicitly counting the elements individually, right? So the number of uh, integers less than or equal to 100 that are divisible by 2 is going to be uh, 100 divided by 2 uh, rounded down. Uh, same thing is true for those divisible by 3. It's 100 divided by 3 rounded down and then uh, so on and so forth. Right? And so then we can use that same nifty arithmetic logic uh, for the pairs. So divisible by 2 and 3 is those divisible by 6. Right? Divisible by 2 and 5 is divisible by 10. Right? Uh, and so and so forth, uh, in such a manner we're, we're counting each of these. Right? Uh, and then you can count them, <laughs> you can double check the, the logic if you want, if you doubt this, right? So uh, you would just be counting by sixes in this case, or we'll do tens because it's shorter. <laughs> um, so divisible by two and five is 10, right? So 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, all the way up to 100. So we would expect that to be 10, and there are in fact exactly 10 elements in this set, right? Divisible by two and five. And so the logic holds, the rule holds for the others, right? And then we uh, compensate for uh, the triples, right? So divisible by two, three, and five, divisible by two, three, and seven, two, five, and seven, three, five, and seven. And then finally, whenever we've dealt with the intersection of all of them, so divisible by two, three, five, and seven, uh, then uh, we've accounted for everything. So, uh, so now these are, I've substituted in the values these so these evaluations so 50 33 20 and 14 and then over here right here and so on and so forth and then uh, this uh, what is it? 3 times 5 is 15 times 7 is 105 so this set was empty and then this set was also empty so that would be 210 right so then both of those were empty so then there are 21 primes in this set, right? So 21 primes less than 100 that are not themselves 2, 3, uh, 5, and 7. So then the total number of primes less than or equal to 100 is 4 plus what we just counted. So 4 plus 21. So our 25 primes not exceeding 100. Uh, okay, so that's uh, more uh, detailed visualization of uh, how to apply the principle of inclusion and exclusion. Okay, uh, let's see. Perfect. Well, we'll just end right here whenever uh, we'll make it through the derangements and then we'll call it a day. Uh, okay, so let m and n be positive integers with m greater than or equal to n. Then there are uh, n to the m minus the combination of n choose 1 right, uh, times n minus 1 to the m plus uh, n choose 2 times n minus 2 to the m, and so on and so forth, uh, on two functions from a set with m elements to a set with n elements. Right. Um, OK, so uh, just recall that uh, the difference between a 1 to 1 and on two function. So um, an on two function means that uh, essentially uh, whenever you define a, a function um, it's not necessarily going to be invertible uh, so uh, if it's one to one and on to then there is going to be a continuous inverse or you know if the function was originally continuous then its inverse would be continuous um, but uh, that doesn't necessarily have to be the case so uh, if a function is onto, it just means that everything uh, is represented uh, in in the output. So everything in the output space is represented, um, but it doesn't necessarily imply that it's going to be uh, invertible. Uh, and so uh, if we go back to what we were discussing with the pigeonhole principle, um, this just means that uh, if you have uh, so if m, m is greater than or equal to n. So let's say that we're dealing with a hash table that has uh, 
uh, 100 slots. It's an, an array of a size 100. Uh, and then there are M, um, so we'll say M is 1,000, right? So there's more uh, objects that we're trying to stuff into the uh, the array or the hash table uh, than, than can possibly fit uniquely. Then this function tells us how many different ways there are to arrange uh, to, to jam them all together essentially uh, to map them onto our output space. Right? Uh, so uh, we know that they're going to collide and, and so on and so forth. And then this is the number of different ways that uh, we could end up uh, grouping them together into these buckets, right? the m elements into the n buckets. Right? Uh, okay. Uh, so a definition: a derangement is a permutation of objects that leaves no object in its original position. Uh, so think about shuffling a deck of cards. So uh, if you were to take a new deck of cards and you you know, you uh, wrote a number on the back of them or or whatever. Um, and then, uh, so you could number them from 1 to 52 or 0 to 51, as you like. Uh, and then uh, if you shuffled them, you know, shuffle them, you know, however many times you need to, uh, then a derangement happens whenever, uh, if you were to uh, write the new number, uh, the ordering of those cards, uh, a derangement is whenever the unshuffled deck, the, the brand new deck, uh, n uh, there is no card where pre-shuffle order of assignment or whatever uh, is equal to the post-shuffled one, right? So everything got moved around essentially. Uh, and so not every derangement is particularly interesting, right? So uh, you could satisfy that condition by just taking uh, the card at the top of the deck and moving it to the bottom of the deck. So typically whenever we're discussing a derangement, we want something a, a little more uh, unpredictable than that, right? Uh, something other than just a, uh, uh, a a cycle, right? Something other than just everything slotting down one position. We want it uh, completely out of order. Right? But uh, the number of derangements uh, for a set with n elements, so this is a theorem now, uh, is equal to, so derangements on n, is equal to n factorial times 1 minus uh, 1 over 1 factorial plus 1 over 2 factorial minus 1 over 3 factorial and so on and so forth uh, until um, where n is the size of the set right? so that even and odd the sign of this last term is determined uh, by whether n is even or odd uh, 1 over n factorial right um, okay uh, right okay uh, so, whenever you think of derangements, I want you to think about shuffling cards, but in the case that everything got moved out of its original position. But, so, this would describe the number of possible outputs for perfect shuffling of cards, but it would also include uh, terrible shuffling of cards, right? Where you take one or two cards from the top of the deck and you stick them at the bottom, or vice versa, you take them from the bottom and you stick them at the top. So that everything is still sequentially the same, but they're out of place from their original position. Right? Uh, so the total number of good and terrible shuffles, but where everything got moved from its original place, uh, is given by this function. Uh, okay, uh, and we will pick up with relations next time. Uh, have a great weekend. Uh, make sure you uh, finish the exam sooner rather than later for your own uh, benefit. And then uh, I will talk to you all on Tuesday.